With more than 6,000 small and micro-cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple, at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to New Methods in Pain Management, a NobleCon online investor event presented by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Noble is an SEC-registered FINRA-licensed broker-dealer and the source of the equity research available on Channel Check. This presentation features Bodax Bio, NASDAQ ticker symbol BXRX, following a brief overview presentation from President and CEO Jerry Henwood, Noble Research Analyst Gregory Aran will moderate a Q&A session. With that, I am pleased to present Jerry Henwood. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you about my favorite topic, Bodax Bio. We're going to go ahead and go through our forward-looking statement next. The lawyers, of course, want you to look at all of our filings before you make any decisions regarding investment. They can be found both on our website and on the SEC Edgar site. Thanks. I'm going to talk mostly about Angesso, which is our first commercial product. We've developed the product, and it was launched in the second half of 2020 which you may recall was not a particularly propitious time for a launch, but we had delayed it already. And we believe that it was helpful to us to be available in the marketplace in 2020. A lot of organizational things got completed. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, the product's been approved for use in moderate to severe pain, alone or in combination with other analgesics that are not NSAIDs. It has, we think, a significant commercial opportunity, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get further into the presentation. We have pipeline candidates in clinical stage development. One of them has just finished a dose escalation study in the neuromuscular blocking agent arena, an anesthetic agent. And there's another one that's ultra short acting that will begin its IND studies in 2022. Our financial position as of the end of the last quarter was approximately 38 million. We've got a great management team that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. So myself, uh, this is thankfully my fourth opportunity to have founded and be running a public company. Uh, we have had good experiences both on the development side on the manufacturing side and with a prior therapeutics company, Auxilium Pharmaceuticals, that I founded. All have done well, and we hope to have similar outcomes at the end of the day with this company as well. Rick Caston is our chief financial officer, lots of diversified financial experience. He has most recently come to us from Lupin Pharmaceuticals. Prior to that, he was with Endo Pharmaceuticals, has good experience in the pharma space as well as overall good management and finance experience from his time at Campbell Soup and previously at Ernst & Young. Yorki Matsala is our head of business development. He has worked with me through a number of companies very successfully doing deals for the company. Prior to joining in a variety of these companies, he had been head of human pharmaceuticals for Orient Pharma. Greg Gangemi is our chief commercial officer. Again, lots of hospital and other launch experience uh, and brings that to the table here as well as great sales management experience and overall commercial expertise. Janice Carter is our VP of marketing. Uh, again, hospital experience from a number of companies, Pfizer, Wyeth, CSL Bearing, and as, had joined us at Recro as well before we split into Baudex Bio from Recro. Paul Badley is our head of commercial operations and brings, again, a wealth of prior experience with him, both from IMS Health and from a number of pharma companies. Thanks. So if we talk about the commercial opportunity, we go to the next slide, thanks. 
the, the four big pillars of the product are that it is a 24 hour pain relief product with one single very small injection that's a direct bolus injection once a day IV push. It has demonstrated good safety and tolerability in more than 1500 patients in double blind clinical trials. And it does bring with it COX-2 preferential characteristics to its NSAID structure that can be incorporated into multimodal analgesia protocols. So if we go next. It is, as I said, a long acting IV form. It uses Alchemy's nanocrystal technology because Loxicam is highly insoluble and gets it to a very stable dosage form that is shelf stable, doesn't require refrigeration, has four years dating. Uh, it's a once a day. Commercial launch is ongoing. Our most recent results reported in Q2 show that we are picking up speed with the product in terms of commercial penetration. Hospital launches are challenging because they require getting formulary approval, both from ambulatory surgical centers doing surgery, as well as from inpatient facilities. And so it's, you know, kind of a house by house fight to get through that. And we have started making very good progress with that towards the end of 20. And in 21, that has picked up some momentum and the usage is, had begun trial usage and now is deepening. We have orange book listed patents that run until 2030. I'm not going to go through all the data in these next few slides, but at our site, you'll see published peer-reviewed journal articles around these pivotal studies that we did, safety study in particular, a large safety study in very diverse surgical conditions, all serious surgeries. And if we look at the next slide, we'll see that the adverse events in this, you have to look at the percentages in parentheses because we put more patients into the ingesso arm at FDA's request and fewer in the placebo arm. But you see comparing the percentages, they're very similar to what is seen in the placebo group, slightly increased from that. And we'll go to the next slide that talks about our pharmacoeconomic data. Again, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but these are two important studies double-blind placebo-controlled, using multimodal analgesia as the background, to which is added either angesso or placebo. And these studies in total knee replacement and in bowel resection gave us important data on the economic efficiency of the product, showing that we could save on average $2,500 a patient for institutions that were using us in total knee arthroplasty as an add-on to MMA, and in bowel resection surgery, that we could save an average of a day of inpatient time faster discharge, and that on average is worth about $2,000 to hospitals. Next. Cute little vial, fits very nicely in Pixis carts, which are what anesthesiologists and CRNAs are using in the ORs. So it can be very handy. It doesn't require refrigeration, doesn't require reconstitution. It's ready to use. Next. If we go into the commercial launch, uh, just giving you a, a look at where we are on the progress, you see that we began to get a little bit of traction after launch in the second quarter. Got a little bit better in third and fourth, although very few formularies were meeting last year. Uh, they were certainly very occupied by COVID and by its impact on their whole institution and formulary meetings and putting new drugs on other than COVID drugs was not a priority. But it, it has returned to somewhat more normal launch behavior for hospital launches in 21. We see good progress in Q1, better in Q2, and we believe that we will show good results for Q3 as well. Uh, sales to hospitals and ASCs were up so most of the parameters were up in the neighborhood of 30%, some up as high as the mid 40s. Next. I think importantly, we saw that in the second quarter, we sold as much as aggregate we had sold in 2020 approximately. And these are, you know, this is a milestone. We want to see ourselves continue to keep growing and adding to this as we go through 21 and into 22. We're looking for a good launching point into 22. Count usage continues to expand as I described. Next slide. 
awareness studies that we've done have shown that the, the messages that we're using around ingestive, the 24 hour pain relief, the first and only once a day, the safety profile is well received and recalled by clinicians. And that those who are looking at the product are looking at increasing their usage over the next three months for a number of these same reasons. So we're happy about that too. What are we focused on in 21? We have been focused on pulling through more accounts where we've gotten Angesso on the formulary. As you may know, we've talked about putting 40 people on board in the field at, at the representative level, the ambulatory surgical level, as well as the hospital level by October. Because of what we've seen with the recrudescence of COVID in July and August, and a number of areas where access is going to be slow or lagging, we've revised that and we'll be looking at approximately uh, low 30s to at most 35 by the end of the year. We'll continue to evaluate based on opportunities. So as I said before, we're looking for places where we can get onto formulary and where we have an opportunity to get pull through. And that's how we're looking at staffing these territories. We're also focused on building more advocacy. Advocacy is required at an even higher level than it might have been in 2019 or 18 because COVID has created a higher threshold to overcome in terms of economic issues within hospitals and the meaningfulness of this product also needs to be advocated for by clinicians. We do see accelerated formulary adoption and gaining of new accounts and that is definitely helping us. How are we doing this? We're a small company. We're not, you know, we don't have a million people in the field. So we're using our field team as a base, as I said, in places where we have access, where we have P&T committee approvals, where we can work for more pull through and more advocacy growing our base. We're adding to that territory advisors. They have now been in place, many of them for about six months. Uh, they are helping our representatives to get introduced to new and additional uh, group practices of orthopedic surgeons, in some cases, general surgeons, to add to those that we've already gotten to know and accelerate that learning curve. Uh, these are 1099 employees that are typically uh, independent uh, individuals selling for a number of smaller orthopedic device companies have very good access to orthopedic surgeons and the OR. We're also using telesales to generally extend our hospital reach. And we have these reps doing uh, calls for awareness, introduction of the product and the profile, and extending our orthopedic reach with a number of reps who had been working for Dupuy as part of the Exparel uh, collaboration that had been going on. And when that was terminated, they became available to a telesales organization who's helping us to use that as, again, an introduction. They can get appointments for our reps in the areas that overlap so that our reps get to go into those practices a little bit earlier and easier than they would have otherwise. We do know from what we've done during 20 and the early part of 21, the telesales can help with awareness and help with the profile, can help get us appointments and a foot in the door they are not as good at closing for a new product in this space that requires representatives to be present. And that's why we continue to be focused on use of the field teams and their effectiveness. <clears throat> We're also, as you would expect, using virtual aids to help us as well. Lots of electronic media and advertising, as well as having uh, programs that support the usage speaker programs, market access and reimbursement programs and the like. So in total, we continue to see Angesso as a great near-term opportunity, one that is growing. We expect to see even more substantial sales in 2022 than we're reporting in 2021 and the ramp is growing well. We think the clinician feedback that we've had from multiple market researches are that they they try the product, they really like it, they're surprised about its ease of use and how effective it is. We've had a number of clinicians 
tell us that they called patients the next morning, especially for same day surgery patients who go home because they were surprised that their nurse practitioner or physician's assistant had not heard from them regarding pain management the night before. And when they've called, they found that the patient has reported that they were in good pain control and they had a good night. And we hope that's gonna be true for many, many more patients. We think this product has potential commercial opportunity in the neighborhood of Affirmev. Uh, it took Affirmev a while to get to its peak. Uh, we, we think that because they were the pioneer, we'll have the opportunity over the next few years to move more quickly. Uh, our pipeline candidates are in clinical stage development. We think they are right on top of the call points that we have. And so as they progress, we, they will become additional opportunities for sale for us. Financial position at this moment is reasonable with 38 million in the bank as of the end of the second quarter. And we're really happy about the team we have. They're doing a great job on the commercial side, on the development side, and I think with really good support from all the other areas of the company. So well, thank you, Jerry, for that excellent presentation on Ingesso and uh, the progress that's being made for Bio. I do have uh, some questions as follow-up, though, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, in terms of the addressable market for Ingesso, what kind of opportunity do you see ultimately in, in the U.S. market? And, and secondly, beyond that, do you see greater adoption in hospitals or ambulatory surgery centers? So good question. And uh, there are some, some twisty answers. One is we think there is, a, there is a really meaningful opportunity for the product. This product, we believe from the market research that we've done and the continuing market research since launch, is very well regarded by orthopedic surgeons and somewhat familiar to them because many of them have used oral meloxicam as part of their practice for patients who didn't yet require surgery to try and manage inflammation and pain for them. Uh, so that's, the, let's say if we just looked at major joint replacements, major orthopedic surgeries, we're looking at at least 11 million procedures a year in normal times for that. If we look at major intra-abdominal surgeries, uh, bowel resections and the like, cholecystectomies, uh, more complex hernia surgeries, those add up to about 11 million procedures as well. And apart from that, we are also seeing usage in plastic surgery. Uh, not something that we had really thought as much about before we had the opportunity to launch, although we did do an abdominoplasty study with plastic surgeons as part of the soft tissue database that we gave to FDA on which uh, approval rested. And they are reporting that they find good pain control and then they don't have to worry as much about their patients leaving their office because they haven't received uh, a lot of opioids that might make them a hazard for driving or you know, fall risk or dizziness or things like that. Uh, there are some pain specialists also using the products in patients who are having radiofrequency ablation, someone who might need to have back surgery, spine surgery, but isn't yet ready or there isn't availability because of surgeries being postponed in their particular hospital or city. And so they're using Ingesso to deal with the pain that the RFA causes. So we think if we look across that, there are opportunities for broad usage, but our focus promotionally is pretty heavily on orthopedics and general surgery. And in terms of who's adopting it now, while there's usage, as I mentioned, in some of these other areas, uh, I think the highest adoption rate would be with orthopedic surgeons because they're doing almost as many procedures in the ambulatory surgical setting as in the inpatient setting. And the ambulatory surgical centers tend to get approved a little bit easier on formulary. Uh, than hospitals where the process, certainly we're not the only game in town, and the process is a little bit longer of waiting in line and getting through the formulary and getting through with enough uh, support across multiple specialty areas that you can get onto formulary. So we're seeing usage in the hospital, and that's growing, but more usage in the ambulatory surgical centers at present. Uh, related to that, is that part of your, your thrust in terms of reaching out? You talked about telesales and, and that kind of thing. Are you looking at the ambulatory surgery market as 
this is a focused outreach or is it across the board in, in this addressable market opportunity? So we've really focused more on what are the kinds of procedures where Ingesso might be a really realistic alternative where it could really help and make a difference. And that takes us both places. It was, if we look back at like 17 and 18, there was a very, pretty small percentage of major orthopedic surgeries that were being done in ambulatory centers. That began to change in 19 as CMS approved doing knees for uh, older patients, Medicare patients in an outpatient setting instead of exclusively inpatient. And then hips have been approved similarly. So we're seeing some more also during COVID, ambulatory surgical centers in many cases were not as curtailed as hospitals because they're not planning for you to stay overnight. So you're coming in and you're leaving, whereas at the hospital with the more complex patients, they might need to have beds reserved for you in case the surgery is a little more complicated, you have a little more bleeding or other risk factors. So when COVID's high occupancy, they can't be doing as much elective surgery. So I think that has skewed us a little more towards ambulatory surgery centers because it's the go where the patients are kind of thing. But in the long run, I think both, we expect that we'll see in the next couple of years that surgeries of this type get split sort of 50-50 between hospitals and surgical centers that are outpatient. I think over the long run, more will move to the outpatient side. So it's not a bad investment, but hospitals are still going to remain important to us. Uh, you touched on the COVID uh, situation in terms of the market um, and also the fact that your timing of approval or a launch, excuse me, wasn't the, the best, but you really just didn't want to delay it. How, how have you seen the, the market opportunity develop more recently now that we're getting somewhat past the COVID environment? And you, uh, as I said, you touched on it, but is there, are there some other key metrics you'd like to share about the, the uh, current market opportunity and the situation there? Yeah, thanks. Um, so. 2020 was was very challenging. We had initially planned to launch in April after our end of February approval, but you know, nature had other ideas in mind. And so we stalled that launch to late June and launched ultimately with a smaller force than we had thought of and further shrunk that force by the end of the summer because it was clear that access was going to remain very very restricted and the formularies were gonna be very limited in terms of the ones that would meet. So we had a smaller force like in the 20s through the end of 2020, but we did manage to get contracts with all the major GPOs and we had made progress. We had, you know, I think close to 80 formulary approvals by the end of last year and we're beginning to get usage. Again, skewed a little more to the outpatient side, but still some very good inpatient centers as well. As we get into this year, it was picking up. I would say as we got into late February, March, there was there was an approach to normalization. I wouldn't use that word as an achievement, but people were trying to get more back to normal and right. surgical activity began in a number of hospitals where it had been highly restricted for much of 20. We did see more formulary approvals start happening then as we get into second quarter. And, you know, really kind of great sort of normal hospital launch activity as we were in second quarter. And then third quarter came. And third quarter, you know, I'm sure you've looked at all the fun stuff out there and morbidity, mortality weekly and all the other CDC and other communications. It, there was a big hit in July and August, in particular to many of the southern states that had not been as badly hit during 20 and early 21. And so that was that was a pinch for us because 40% of our current customers are in that space. But I give credit to our guys, we're finding ways to win. I think the relationships that they've been working on through, can I meet you in the hospital parking lot at 5 a.m. when you're coming in to scrub before surgery? And you know that gets a few points with surgeons because if you're willing to get up at that hour to come talk to them, you know, they, they might be willing to try your product or, you know, at least consider it more deeply. And that that has helped us to get through with still growth happening in the third quarter in spite of July and August. And September seems to be more normalizing. Hopefully we'll see things continue to recede. But, you know, our attitude has been, I think COVID may come and go. I can't second guess all the pundits in that space, but 
you know, it's, it is unlikely to disappear from the face of the U.S. till we see the rest of the world get vaccinated. We got to find ways to win in spite of that. And I think the team, to their credit, is really doing a good job of that. You mentioned uh, the formulary access. Um, and can you walk us through a little bit about the process of getting on a formulary on one of your accounts and, and you know, how it's developed despite COVID? Sure. So the, the first thing is you you need to be getting clinicians who might use the drug interested in using it. And you can't do that in a bubble because you've also got to engage the pharmacy. Pharmacy is frequently the gatekeeper and the organizer of the P&T committees because they're the, they'll be the therapeutic source of the products once they get approved. And pharmacy in these days has been told by most administrations, save me money. We're, we're crunched, save me money this year. So their first reaction is, no, I don't care what you have, no. But if you continue to work with them, and we have former directors of pharmacy who are also our health economics experts who are doing some, if you will, peer-to-peer -peer selling with that group and going through the data and going through the why does this make sense for the hospital. And then often we go to the C-suite because if the C-suite sees that it can really save the institution money on inpatient days or utilization of services that they're not gonna get extra on the DRG for, they can save money and avoid over expenses on the DRGs. That's really helpful. So you've built, you're building simultaneously your clinician outreach, the anesthesiologist who will be involved in likely giving the drug in the perioperative timeframe and the pharmacist. So on average, you're gonna be calling on a medium-sized hospital three to six months, a bigger hospital, you know, nine to 12, sometimes more. Uh, and if we follow a pattern similar to what Cadence followed with Offermav in their early launch years, you know, it's gonna take two or three times in front of the formulary committee before you're able to break through at the biggest institutions. So that we look to be following that similar pattern, at least if we go by what's been happening in 21. ASCs are a little bit different. ASCs will, uh, especially those that are independent of major hospital integrated delivery networks, they may have a smaller group that represents their formulary committee. It may be a pharmacist who works with the team, an anesthesiologist, and a few of the surgeons. So it is a little bit easier to find a time when they could listen to more information about the product, ask questions, buy one or two units for trial usage, and then make a formal formulary decision. So that, that has also helped our access to outpatient surgeries to be a little bit quicker. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and I might be, but you're up for a permanent uh, J code here coming um, October 1st, accessing Actually, the formula. Because we got lucky and CMS changed their rules of timing after approval to get the J code, we did get our J code by the end of last year. And so we have a J code for 21. And I think that has really helped. It has made it less of a concern for ASCs. You know that cash flow is very tight in those businesses. And there, there would be an anxiety about how long, will it be a manual review if it's a C code? How long will it take till we get reimbursed those funds? And those that have been using the product have been finding that it's, it's pretty now automatic in the sense that it, it isn't a manual review. It's just the usual J-code process to get reimbursed. And I think that helps. That helps remove one more negative concern about a new product and lets people try it and then adopt it a little bit more quickly. Um, you touched on some of the positives you received from physicians um, on Ingesso. Can you give us a little more color uh, as to physician response and also patient responses in terms of how they see the product relative to what they may have been using previously or or other for other pain problems. Sure. So I think maybe start with the patient side first, because ultimately, if we do that right, I think that continues to help reinforce the role and the utility of the product. And what we hear from clinicians, again, heavily skewed to orthopedic surgeons because there have been more of those episodes a lot more of the complex intra-abdominal surgeries are in hospital and have been lagging a little bit just procedurally. Uh, but they're 
they're telling us that, you know, the clinicians themselves were skeptical about whether or not patients would have pain relief for the better part of the 24 hour period that's in the label. And that when they call the patients themselves, sometimes wanting to check instead of taking the word of the nurse practitioner who might've been doing the follow-up check, patients are really feeling very good. In fact, many patients are doing so well that they're leaving the post-op or PACU area and getting ready for discharge much faster than the surgeons were used to when they've gotten in just so. And so they've had to adjust their visiting times a little bit. They often would visit between cases to say that, hey, how you doing? Looks good. Here, you know, have a great day. Call if you have any problems. They have to, they're having to move a little bit faster to do that, but happy to do so. Because that also means that there's better flow for the OR and a better ability for them to continue to address all the patients that are on the schedule for that day. Patients have uh, tolerated the drug very well. We have relatively few adverse events. I'm not, it is a drug. It is not without its potential for adverse events. I don't want to give that permission, you know, that impression, but certainly patients, patients are doing well and they're not having the grogginess, the, as much of a dizziness and fall risk as they would have had, had they gotten more opioids. You mentioned some issues about, or not issues, but benefits of efficacy and that patients are seeing 24 hour pain relief. Um, and you mentioned also that you use a nanocrystal technology to for the for the injection. Um, how how does that work, and what benefit does it offer, say, versus the oral method? So oral uh, meloxicam is a good product, but it is pretty insoluble. So it takes a long time. There's a pretty high degree of variability in how long to get to peak levels. It can take anywhere from three to five hours to get to peak levels when you take it orally. So it, it's not as good an immediate pain relief. It's used for chronic pain appropriately in that area. The nanocrystal technology, because we get to these ultra fine particles that can more readily be absorbed and deployed, we do see much faster onset of efficacy. The onset of efficacy begins within, you know, like 10 or 15 minutes after you've gotten the injection. You get to your peak typically at about an hour. And you know, so you've got pain relief on the way up and then it's lasting for a very long time. So I think it's really the enabling technology that Alchemy's provided in the nanocrystals that's really allowing this product that would have been very tough to get good results from otherwise to, to perform well in this acute setting. Um, in terms of potential future indications, are there any for Angesso? I mean, you've got most that that uh, market, it seems like, but are there other areas you might be able to use it in? Well, we're certainly, as we look at the opportunities that clinicians are bringing forward to us, we're looking at some trials that will be an investigator initiated where we might provide product to them or, you know, some, some form of support. More so the clinicians have some guideposts and published articles for how to use it in those conditions. But I think we we sort of got hurt by FDA and then lucked out by with FDA. So the hurt was the two CRLs that we had that delayed our ability to launch the product that were ultimately overcome by an appeal in which the appellate reviewer said, actually, you have enough basis to get approved and you have had that all along. We didn't submit any new clinical data to the FDA in order to get that. So that, that kind of hurt us. But on the other hand, the label that we got, while appropriate, is also nice and broad. Uh, it does not relate to any specific surgical condition or other type of use, as long as it is for the management of moderate to severe pain. And all the patients that we studied were moderate to severe pain. And it was a very broad variety of orthopedic surgeries, uh, open, surgical conditions on the abdomen as well as closed and laparoscopic conditions. So I think we had a nice spectrum that gave the agency comfort that it would work in those settings and that it would be tolerated well, that it would perform with, you could have reasonable expectations that could be met from the product. Um, you mentioned you're not a small, or not a big operation, and right now you rely a great deal on telesales, but are you thinking of expanding the, the actual uh, beat on the ground Salesforce type situation? We, we are, we have right now, um, if we looked at where we were in June, we had about 26 reps on the field. And then as we saw some territories open up 
in July and August that were mostly in the central US because those had been kind of clamped down. If we look back in April, May, you know, Minnesota, Michigan, those areas were having problems, but they opened up, we got some formulary approvals. So we added to that and that plus another five reps that we're adding on should bring us into the low 30s by next Monday. And then, you know, we will have possibly another couple added by the end of the year. So I think we will see ourselves end the year with between, you know, mid thirties uh, to just a couple more than that. In terms of um, pipeline, you, you touched on it briefly at the beginning of the presentation. Can you give us a little more flavor about that in terms of, I think you said the neuromuscular blocking agent um, just finished the study. Um, can you give us a little more color on that as well as any other pipeline um, considerations you have? Sure. So the, the, Products that are currently in our pipeline that are getting the, the most attention. Obviously, we're we're balancing the expense of the launch and trying to make our goals that we owe to our partner Cornell uh, with those products in development, but it, it isn't a huge spend just because of the balance sheet that we have right now. But the the 1000 compound, the BX1000, is an intermediate acting neuromuscular blocking agent. And you may know, but for some of the listeners who may not know, neuromuscular blocking agents are used typically to paralyze the body. They paralyze every muscle in the body and most importantly, the vocal cords. So that if I'm going to have to put a breathing tube in you, I can safely put that down your trachea without ripping your vocal cords. And so that gets used at the start of surgery. And for certain surgeries, it's used to maintain it. If you were having surgery on your trunk, like uh, cardiothoracic surgery or major abdominal surgery, you don't want those muscles to have involuntary movement during surgery. So you may keep the patient on a neuromuscular blocking agent for the length of the procedure. I would say most usually that's going to be under an hour or about an hour. Uh, you can infuse the products to make them last longer. So the first one that we've that we've done this dose escalation in is to prove that you have a margin above what would be the effective dose for most patients that you could go before you hit uh, unwanted side effects that would be limiting. And so we'll have those results that we can share with everybody, we hope within about a month, uh, because they've been going through the data analysis. And there's lots of parameters that you have to look at for these early studies for safety for patients as well as to report back to FDA. Uh, but that would then in next year potentially be ready to move on to more surgical conditions nice. and studies in patients actually undergoing surgery as opposed to volunteers. Uh, with the RP, excuse me, BX was Recro Pharma, so they were RP, but now they're BX for Botox Bio. BX2000 is an ultra short acting agent. So it has a normal decay of about 10 to 12 minutes once you give it. So if all that you really needed to do was to intubate the patient and you weren't looking to have to maintain paralysis, like you were gonna do a nerve block or something else, but the patient had compromised respiratory function, needed respiratory support during surgery, that would give you plenty of time to intubate the patient. And then you wouldn't have to use a reversal agent if you wanted to stop sooner. So that's that's a plus. Both of these agents, however, have reversal agents that go with them. It's the same agent is effective against both eight drugs and very quickly and systemically reverse it so that at least based on monkey data to date, within one to three minutes, it's completely reversed. And it's a single dose. Uh, so Gamadex, which is a good product that's out there marketed by Merck, is used for the um, uh, a number of other neuromuscular blocking agents that are oldies but goodies. But you have to know where you are in the procedure to know how much of that you need to give. Is it one vial, which is kind of expensive, or is it two vials to reverse it completely? And there isn't a way to, other than judgment, to guess that. And I think anesthesiologists are not thrilled with that aspect of it. it. I think with an agent that's going to be, no matter whether you're beginning of the case or the end of the case, you just give this one shot of the reversal agent. I think that's going to be seen attractively too. So we think there are a number of things about these products. If they fulfill their profiles, they are early, 
So, you know, there's more work to be done, but if they fulfill their profiles, I think they could offer some nice advantages over products that are currently used for both blockade and for reversal. Um, in terms of, you know, um, funding requirements, you have a lot on your plate. Um, you recently raised some um, funds, I think in the second quarter, mm -hmm. through a, a placement, um, but what's your um, cash position right now and what does your runway look like? So as you know, we're just about at the end of the quarter and we won't be able to report for a little bit longer uh, on the actual cash. But, you know, we have been, if you look at where we were through the second quarter, we've been burning in the neighborhood of four to four and a half million outside of occasional extraordinary expenses like some milestones that we owe to Alchemies that were paid in the first quarter and, and one was paid in the second quarter. So we have some runway that would take us into second quarter of next year, but obviously it's not, you know, it's not the be all and end all. There will be things that we'll look to address. We hope that as we continue to grow sales, there will be a time when we can perhaps taps the debt markets a little bit more, but I think there's going to be a need for some equity raise over the next year in any case. I thank you again for the opportunity to uh, discuss the company uh, with you and your presentation. Jerry, I appreciate it indeed. Uh, I thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. It's Thanks, been Frank. fun. Thank you for joining us for this NobleCon online investor event presentation brought to you by Channel Check and Noble Capital Markets. Visit our YouTube channel for more video content, including interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and the 6,000 other small and micro cap companies listed.